Hi, friends. We are going to talk about two huge questions today in our You Ask For It series. And I honestly cannot think of two questions that are more important than the ones we're going to talk about today. I, th I can't think of two questions that I think it's more important that you get right and that we all get right. So, in fact, as we've been thinking about this question, I've been thinking about a scripture that kind of talks a little bit about it. I want to share it with you. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. It says this. Maybe you've heard this before. It says, um, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it like entered into the mind or the heart or the imagination of any human the things that God has planned or prepared for those who love him. We're talking about the things that come next that God has prepared. And we can't even really imagine it. And yet, it goes on to say in the next verse, but you've seen it, you've heard it, you know this stuff. Why? Because God by his spirit has brought it all out in the open before you. Friends, that's what we want to do today. We want to bring out into the open the stuff that God has planned and prepared for us, not just in this life, but the next as well. And I want to just encourage you as we talk about these things to kind of keep your spirit open and bring your, let your spirit be governed and guided by God's spirit in these things. These verses go on to say, if you don't do that, here's what you'll do. When we talk about some of these questions, you'll have a moment or two where you'll say to yourself, well, that's not the way I would do it if I were God. Guess what? You're not God. And neither am I, which is why you've got to come with a sort of humble spirit and seek to understand the mind of God as best you can. And in fact, that verse ends with this, with this uh, that passage ends with this verse, but we do understand these things. God has shown it to us, for we have the mind of Christ. I want to encourage you to have the mind of Christ today as so we go at two huge questions, okay? And uh, if you have the mind of Christ, you'll have the truth, all right? And the truth will set you free. The first one's a big one. I hear it a lot. And um, you've probably asked maybe a version of this question yourself, perhaps. It's something like this. Aren't all religions basically the same? Aren't they kind of like the same thing with just like different window dressings? Or aren't they kind of like roads that all sort of like lead up the same mountain going to the same destination? Aren't all roads? Yeah, that's a hard I have no idea how to answer that. Jared, you got any ideas? <laughs> yeah. Let me, I hope so. Take it see, away. Let me see what I can do. Okay. Do um, you mind if I lift this up a little bit? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. Whatever. Yeah, it's, it's a big question for us to answer. It's huge. Uh, I think it's important that, that we take some time to, to understand that it's, it's actually, I think, quite simple in theory, but in practicality, maybe it's a little bit more complex. Okay, let me explain that to you. Maybe you've been driving down the road before and you've seen one of these bumper stickers that say uh, coexist on it, right? Written with all the different religious icons and symbols. Or, or maybe like the newer one that I've seen a lot more is this one. It says respect written the same way. And, and in a way, you know, I've come to really value what these bumper stickers are trying to represent because I think one of the values is something that, that Christianity actually preaches, and that's that we're to love and respect people. Now, you may remember in Matthew 22, the greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment. Well, let's just have a little pop quiz, okay, Mount? We're going to see how well we do. All of our campuses, you're going to participate. Uh, we're going to see who gets it right. Then you're going to participate too. Let's, let's see who can get it, okay? We're going to sum up the greatest commandment in the second in four words, and two of them are love. So you got half the answer already, okay? Here we go. Let's see if we can do it all together. It is to love God and love people. people. There we go. We know it, right? Like, that's the greatest commandment. We're, we're supposed to love people. So let's start right there by saying, hey, um, the, 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 this can represent something important for us to know that, that we're going to set the stage right away of saying, uh, no matter what someone else believes, our job as people who love Jesus is to also love them, no matter what. Not to cast judgment or chastise, but to love and respect them as people who were created in the very image of God and because of that have great value and great worth. It's simple. We love people, all people, even people we disagree with, okay? However, I mean, we, we know those bumper stickers weren't necessarily created with that in mind. Rather, uh, they're created to, to, with a larger, grander sense of acceptance of everything as long as we believe in something and are living a good life. It'll all lead us to the same destination, hopefully. Lots of people, people they believe there, there are multiple ways to heaven. There, there are a whole bunch of gods, but actually there's just one. They all just have a different name. Like, Jesus is a form of God. Or Buddha is a form of God. Or Allah is a form of God. And the list could go on and on. And the trend right now is just to believe in something and try to be a good person. And hope that by doing so much good, you might be able to offset some kind of cosmic scale of good versus bad and find your way to the good place. There's actually a show all about this right now. Maybe you've seen it. It's called The Good Place. I watched a few episodes. It's funny. 
but the theological principles it's trying to, to present to us is points-based salvation. You do enough good, you can offset the bad and find your way to the good place. That makes religion like more of a buffet. Now you take your pick. Pick the one that looks the best and just be sincere and do what works for you. All options must be equally valid. Culturally, I, I'm not surprised that this is the most popular way to, to find belief in God. And I actually find myself struggling with something here. This is the complex part, okay? Our culture loves to accept people as they are. I think that's great. I think it's awesome. Think of the heartbeat of mountain. That's, that's what we want to be, a place that accepts people for who they are. We say when you walk in here that, that this is for everyone. Mountain is for everyone. It's important that we know that and we believe it. This place is for everyone. Black, white, gay, straight, sinner, saint, or at least maybe you think you are, okay? Uh, Baptist, Catholic, Jesus follower, Buddhist, Muslim. We say welcome home because we want you to know that you're welcome here because Jesus loves you and we love you. No matter who you are, whatever your starting point, however messed up, whatever background, you're invited into a journey with God. And he's changing us and he's drawing us into his likeness and calling us to be on mission with him. And so we as Christ followers, we just want to be a reflection of that kind of Jesus love. To say we accept you just as you are. However, the major difference Okay, and this is important. The major difference between Christianity and culture is that our culture is okay accepting you as you are and saying, you're fine, just, just stay who you are. You don't need to change. You do you. You care about what you care about. Your truth is your truth, and that's cool. No pressure to change. Just be a good person, and that's plenty. That's enough. Well, it's not quite the way that Christianity works. You're welcome here just as you are. Don't get me wrong. You're accepted. But because of our deep love for God and the way that Jesus has transformed our lives and brought us to the best life possible this side of eternity, he's given us this deep value to love others. We know that God wants to welcome you as you are, but God doesn't want to leave you there. He wants you to experience life to the fullest. I mean, spiritually speaking, I, I don't want to stay where I am right now. I want to continue to grow, to be more like Jesus. And I hope we all have that same passion. It's the passion of Paul that we see in Romans where he says just pursue righteousness, pursue trying to be more like Jesus. So while the world around us is saying just if we accept you, just be a good person, stay as you are. Christianity is saying God is saying he accepts us, but he wants us to experience life to the fullest. For now and eternity. And scripture's clear about how you can do that. It's by committing your life to and doing life with Jesus. And Jesus alone. Don't get me wrong, friends. We accept you. But man, we want to see you change the name of Jesus because we've come to realize that life with Jesus is the best life. And for those of us who have committed our lives to Christ and we've chosen to be a Jesus follower, we know that as we do that, like, like Jesus naturally starts to ask more from us. He asks us to, to, to change in certain ways, to reflect his character and his being. And we find ourselves wanting to, because the more in love with Jesus we fall, the more he makes us like himself. So to answer our question, do all roads lead to the same place? While we respect others and care deeply, have genuine affection for those we disagree with, the answer is quite simple. No, no, they don't. If you read the Bible and you believe in Jesus, then you know there's no scoreboard. There's no cosmic scale. There's just the beautiful grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, presented to each of us as we surrender to him. Why do we, why do we believe that? Well, simply because it's the thing Jesus said. As we look at the Bible, as we examine Scripture, we realize that that's what Jesus points at over and over again. Do you all hear, um, we're, we're launching a new campus in 2020 called Aberdeen Campus. Anybody pump for the Aberdeen Campus? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I got to tell you, the excitement and energy around it's just been tremendous. And, and last Saturday, we did this big prayer event where people come in and write prayers and scriptures all over the walls and the, the floors and the beams, anywhere they wanted to. And uh, I went up Monday and just kind of walked around that facility and read prayer after prayer, scripture after scripture. And as tears kind of filled my eyes, just seeing the way that God is already at work in that community. Of course, I ran across this verse, John 3.16, and here's what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him, in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. That scripture goes on to say, for God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. 
And again, on the wall at Aberdeen in John 14, Jesus wants to ensure we're getting the point. He says this, uh, he wants us to make sure we're, we're, we're soaking this in. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus makes this claim known, but it's not just Jesus who does. Now, all those people who interacted with the resurrected king, the resurrected Jesus, well, then they also are saying the same thing, and we have it documented in our scriptures. Peter, he says this in Acts 4, he says, there's, there's salvation in no one else. No one else, the only place. God has given no other name under heaven by which we could be saved. You've heard of Paul, that guy who once opposed Christ and now uh, has this miraculous interaction and gives his life to Jesus. Sees him after his resurrection, experiences after, after his resurrection. Well, now he says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. What do you confess? That Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, the Bible clearly shows us that Jesus is our path to the one true living God. Jesus is the litmus test for whether or not we truly know the Father. And Jesus brings this up. He's talking to some religious folks, some Pharisees, and he finds himself uh, kind of arguing with them. He says, Here, here's the deal, guys. You know neither me nor my Father, because if you knew me, you could also know my Father. And in John 6, everyone who has learned from the Father, well, first they come to me. It starts with Jesus. In other words, what Jesus is saying is knowing Jesus is the only real way to know the Father, the one true King of the universe, God of the universe. And all scripture points to this one universal unifying fact, okay? Here's what it says. Sin enters the picture. We kind of push God away. We run from God. We distance ourselves from God. And then God sees himself on mission trying to bring us back to himself. And all of scripture, the entire arc of the Old Testament, it all points to one moment in which we can find wholeness in God again, and that is through the person and being of Jesus Christ. The, the birth, burial, and resurrection. Only through Jesus can salvation be found to anyone who calls on him. Salvation is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. So friends, we got a choice to make. I've got a choice to make. My kids have a choice to make. We each have a choice to make. We could choose to investigate, really dig in, find out who Jesus is, see if the claims are, tr are true, or we can take the lazy way out. Take our chances, hedge our bets, choose to plead ignorance and try to offset that scale of good versus evil, good versus bad. Let me say, I sure hope you choose to investigate because what's on the line is just far too important. And I know I'm not up here stomping around, screaming, firing brimstone and yelling at you, okay? But don't let that fool you into thinking about what we're talking today is not super important because it is. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about immortality. We know how to find it and never lose it. And that's in the person of Jesus and Jesus alone. So do your homework. Like dig in, find out for yourself. We're in that season of life in my household where, where homework is just like all the time, right? Every single day. And you guys know it gets dark at like 4 p.m. now, right? And my son gets home at 3.30. He's like, Dad, I gotta go play. It's gonna be dark soon. No, you have to do your homework, son. He doesn't wanna do his homework. He wants to go play. But when he does it, he always sees the value in it every time. Is there any homework more important is there anything more important to investigate than what's on the line for this life than eternity? Go dig in. Read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you've never read them, just start reading and find out about who Jesus is and the way that he lived and the way that he treated people and the way that he cared about people and the, the claims he made and the proof that he offers. You, you want some extra reading? There's a bunch of great resources out there. Go find them. Books like The Reason for God, The Case for Christ, Jesus Among Other Gods. The list of resources out there is too good, and it's right at our fingertips. So dig in, and I'm willing to bet that when you seek the truth about Jesus, you will find Jesus. And when you seek the truth, the truth will set you free. And the truth is Jesus, faith in him, and him alone will lead us to eternity. You know, some will claim that, that saying, like, Jesus is the only way, well, that can be seen as arrogant or, and, or hateful. And my response to that is, well, I guess if you keep it to yourself, maybe it is. You know, Jesus calls us not to take our light and put it under a bowl, but instead to put it out there where everybody can see. 
If you know Jesus, if, you, if you've given your life to Christ, then allow people to see the love of Jesus through you, the way that you live, the way that you act. And I've got lots of friends who, who truly know Jesus, and they act like Jesus, like for real. They care about people. They serve people. They act like Jesus acted. And nobody that I know sees them as arrogant or hateful. To claim Christ is to be like Christ. And while Christ made exclusive claims about being the only way to salvation, do you ever notice how he interacted and treated people who needed to know their way to God? He was full of compassion. He served them. He loved them. He cared for them. He helped them. Christianity is not mean, it's not arrogant, it's not exclusive. No, it's open, it's welcoming, it's filled with hope, and it's for everyone. Some of us, we're kind of nodding along, like, yeah, that's right, Jesus is the way, woo! Well, let me ask you, if you believe it, are you living like it? If you really believe that, if you know it, if you've experienced it and turned towards Jesus, if you have the hope of salvation and eternity found in him and him alone and you're keeping it to yourself and you're not feeling a sense of urgency to help other people know, well, then friends, we got a problem. Now, I always reflect back on, on this video that I watched. It was by this guy named Penn Gillette. He's a magician out in Vegas. Uh, Penn and Teller is their show, and he's, he's like world famous, right? He's got a YouTube channel with hundreds of thousands of followers, and he is like a devout atheist, and he lets everybody know it. He doesn't shy away from it. And he told this story in one of his videos after his show. He went back to his dressing room and filmed himself in this story. It goes like this. A guy came up to him. This is my paraphrase of it. This guy came up to him after the show and handed him a Bible and just said, hey, I hope that you'll come to know Jesus in more or less words. And Penn took that Bible and went and retreated and started to reflect on that moment. And one thing is it's so clear that this guy had a conviction that eternity was on the line. That heaven and hell were at stake and that the only way there was through Jesus. He reflected on it. He's like, why don't more people who believe it talk about it? And this is an atheist saying it. Here's an actual quote from him. He says, how much do you have to hate someone to believe everlasting life is possible and then not tell them about it? Friends, if you believe it and you're keeping it to yourself, then ask yourself why. Because eternity is on the line. And we're commanded to love God and love people. And one of the best ways that we show love for people is by helping them see the good news and sharing Jesus with them. You know, Paul in Romans 10, he, he talks about this a little bit. He, he, he says, like, he's got this passion, this zeal for people to know the Lord, to know Jesus. And his urgency clearly points towards his deep understanding of the singular way to salvation found in Jesus. He says this. I think we can hear these as words given to us today, okay? He says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? Well, let's pause there for a second. Let me ask you, what, what is your they? Who is your they? Who are they to you? Have you ever wrestled with that question? Like, like maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your brothers and sisters. Like, who are they who don't know Jesus? Who are they? Maybe it's your neighbors. You walk out the front door and you look around and you see all these people that don't know the way. Or maybe they are the people that you work with each and every single day in the cubicle next to you. Maybe they are the other kids lining the hallway at your middle school or high school. Maybe they is your barista who every morning when you go into Starbucks, you get to see and interact with. Who are they? Be thinking about who they are and then allow Paul's words to speak to you. Here's what he says. And how can they, whoever they are to you, believe in the one of whom they had not heard? And can, how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news, who share the gospel. If you know Jesus, then you know the way. And it's not yours to keep. And in a world that's living in ambiguity around how to get to the good place, let's show them the true way to life everlasting on this side of eternity and on the other. And that's through Jesus and Jesus alone. So church, listen up. Permission granted. You are sent. You've got a name, right? Who are they? You are sent. You are commissioned. Go and preach the good news. Live like Jesus. Be Jesus. And when people ask you what's different about you, you can just give all credit to the one person who offers us salvation. 
who offers us redemption in this life and the next, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except through him, so let's be committed to helping people find out who he is. I was just reading those prayers up at our Aberdeen campus. I came across one that I think just so clearly articulates what we're talking about here. The fact that the reason we launch campuses, the reason we come together to be sent out again is to help people find Jesus. And here, here's what it said. Maybe this can be a prayer for us as we think about what it looks like to be on mission with Jesus and understand the great promises we have in him. It said, Heavenly Father, fill this place with everything that is you. Let this place be here in your glory and to help those in and around Aberdeen come to learn about you, Jesus. To, come, to find comfort in you, Jesus, in your love, comfort in your presence, Jesus, and to have a relationship with you, Jesus. Lord, I, I know that you're going to move mountains here. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's one way to salvation. Don't keep it to yourself. So do all paths lead to the same place? No. Jesus stands alone and Jesus stands the test of time. But every, it's a path that everyone can find. No one, can, no, no one is exempt and pushed out of the way. Everyone can find it. If we humble ourselves and trust Christ and believe in him, then we know he'll not only be with us every moment of every day in this life, but he promised us to bring us to life everlasting, eternal life. That sound good? Don't you wonder what eternal life is like? I don't know that. Ben's got to answer that one, okay? So we're going we're gonna to let Ben come up and answer that one. You ready? We'll give it a shot. Give it a shot. <laughs> you good? You need any lower? Good. You good? I'm good. I'm good. A friend of mine uh, got cancer, and... We did what you would do, what we always do. We prayed. He didn't get better. He got worse. In fact, eventually they brought in one of those hospital beds into his living room, kind of a home hospice kind of thing. And he was there. I visited him there. Um, it's pretty clear he was coming down toward the end. His unshaven cheeks were sunken in. And I sat down in the chair next to him by the, uh, like a TV tray, had some ice chips and Kleenex box and a Bible on it. And this is a guy who had trusted the Lord Jesus as his Lord and Savior and been baptized here at Mountain. But in that place, he, he had some questions. He was trying to get his spiritual house in order, understandably. He had some fears. He had a couple questions, and one of them was, as I leaned in, he, he asked, he said, what else do I need to do? What else do I need to do? Is Christ enough, I think is what he was asking. Another question he had was, um, so what happens next? Apparently he'd never died before. And so he's asking the questions that we all have, all of us. How does this go down? Is Christ enough? What about the afterlife? I know this life, I got, that's what we've seen, I've got it, but, but what about the afterlife? And friends, I don't know when or how that time's going to come for you, whether Jesus comes back first or whether you're going to be like him, and, but chances are you're, you're going to breathe your last one day, and I don't know that many people that are really looking forward to that. Maybe you're like Woody Allen, who said, I don't mind dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> but you're going to be there, so am I, we're going to be there when it happens, and you know, Scripture has so much to say to answer those questions that we have. And I think of the sort of clear options that are open to us. Hebrews 9 kind of reminds us of that, it says, and just as each person is destined to die once... After that comes judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. 
And he will come again, not to deal with our sins who are in Christ, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly awaiting him. And the question, the uber important question is, are you one of those who's eagerly awaiting his return, or are you one of those who's more anxiously fearing your departure? I picked up that Bible from his nightstand and read to him a verse I want to share with you right now from 1 Thessalonians 4, because it's written for people like us when we have those questions. Verse 13 and following, it says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who have died. Don't you ever, haven't you ever wondered and worried about someone who's, got, who's gone or your own fate? The Bible says, we don't want you to be ignorant about this. So you will not grieve like people who have no what? Hope. You will still, the sin is still affecting our bodies and our life and we'll have grief, but you won't grieve like someone without hope. And then he goes on to talk about how the Lord will descend and the trumpet will blow and we'll be with the Lord and, and, and all of that. And, and it says, the, we will be with the Lord forever. And it ends by saying, so encourage one another with these words. I hope you leave encouraged today with words like this because I think God wants us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you trust Christ as the way, truth, and life, as Jared said, not only is that enough, but he's got something incredible planned for us. That eye is not seen or ear is not heard or you can't even imagine it, what God has planned for us. In fact, if you trust Christ, things are going to be so much better than you can probably think of right now for you one day. And if you reject Christ, the Bible also makes it clear that things will be probably a whole lot worse than most people expect. And it all comes down to that choice Jared was talking about, kind of the all-important matter of what you do with Jesus. I know this isn't really that comfortable or easy to talk about, not super pleasant, but we got to make sure we understand that, that heaven isn't like a default destination for every human, like you just sort of end up there if you don't make a choice. No, no, you, you got to choose heaven on God's terms. God empowers you to make that choice where you will spend your eternity. It's like, who's, who's been to Pat's in Philly to buy a cheesesteak? Anybody? A lot of you have been there, right? You go in there, there's only, there's only two kinds you can get, right? You got the cheese on it or not. And then the menu, it says wit or wit out. That's it. Which one you want, wit or wit out. And you better have your answer ready or, or you're not, they're not, not going to go well. Back of the line. And the Bible says that we all get to choose, not our cheesesteak only, we get to choose whether we will spend eternity with or without God. And God longs for us to, to, to come into a relationship with him and remain with him. But if we reject Christ, then you would be choosing to inhabit a place with others who have also refused redemption. And it's not a place like the cartoons, where you're sort of in some waiting room somewhere, sipping a drink, waiting for something to happen. Some little imp walks by and makes a wisecrack. It's not the way it's going to be. It's going to be a place of utter misery. First, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 and following, talks about those who refuse this good news of Jesus as being, quote, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. I don't know if we can even imagine that. Forever separated from God. If you choose to turn away from God because you think, I think it's going to be a better life or it sounds more fun without him or I don't know if I believe in God or whatever your reason, you're shutting yourself out from the presence of God. The Bible describes it as a place of outer darkness and misery and wailing and gnashing of teeth and regret and shame and sorrow and suffering because that's all that's left if you choose to be away from God. So there's a choice to be made and the reason for that is because God didn't create us like little robots. He created us in his image, which means we have this will within us to enter into real relationship because it turns out that's how love works. You can't sort of force it on someone. That's not love. And God has gone first and made the move to invite us into a relationship with him. And that we do through trusting Christ. But if you don't want that, you can say no. And you can say no to God's eternal kingdom of love and light and hope and joy and peace. And God will be very sad about that. He doesn't want anyone to perish. But God will be forced to honor your choice. That's how he made you. God doesn't send anyone to hell. But you could send yourself if you're too proud to say, I think I might need God. I might need help on this one. Either, either you will say in your lifetime while you have breath, 
Thy will be done, and you will trust him and let him have his way in your life, or he will be forced on the last day of your life to say, Thy will be done, and you'll get what you wanted, which is a life separated from God. The doors of hell are locked from the inside, and you've got the key. And so scripture talks about, in, in Revelation 20, that, that the books will be opened and, and all that is done in secret will be laid bare and all of us are, are coming, to, to, those who don't trust Christ in this life will be judged at that moment and we come up short, the wages of sin is death, it's, it's not good, there's a condemnation waiting for all of us, we don't, God isn't going to grave on a curve or take the top 20%, it's like against the standard of Christ, we all fall short and if you choose not to reach out for that relationship, God's going to have to honor that decision and you will have condemned yourself because you'll say, I can, I can overcome the curse of sin all by myself. And you're going to be wrong. But the good news is that you can choose your eternal destiny while you, if you are still breathing, you can choose a relationship with Christ. And he gives the deal of a lifetime so that when the books are open for you because of what he's already done on the cross... When the books are open next to your name, there will be no crimes, no sins, no mistakes, no condemnation listed. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. John 5, he actually said it this way. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins. For they have already passed from death to life. You say yes to Christ while you have breath. Man, I'll tell you what. You not only don't have condemnation, you have something so great we can only imagine. I had a buddy one time, he says, I know you're a preacher and all that, but I, I'm not very excited about heaven. In fact, I don't, I don't know if I believe in heaven. I said, really, tell me about that. And when he did, I understood immediately why. Because he had the same understanding that I think a lot of people have about heaven. And he described it, and it was this ridiculous place where you're floating around on a cloud somewhere, playing a harp. He was wearing a robe. He had to sing in the choir. It was, it was like boring. It was a never-ending church service. He couldn't, say, he couldn't handle it. He was just like, and I was like, man, I'm, uh, if that's heaven, I don't want to go either. And fortunately, it's not what the Bible says. What is heaven like? The Bible, Bible doesn't picture us as floating up as some spirits in the sky someday. It, God comes here and he makes a new heaven and a new earth and a new kingdom. And heaven is not so much about a place, it's about a promise and a presence. A promise that God says is so great it gives you undefeatable hope. And a presence that's so amazing it can help you have comfort through anything life brings on this earth. It's a promise and a presence. Let's talk about those. Heaven is a, first of all, a promise. It's a promise. At the end of the day, it's not so much how much faith you have as what you're placing your faith in that matters. Okay? Does that make sense? Faith is only as good as the object you're believing in. It's like a rope. It's what you tie it to that matters. And Faith for the believer is faith in God. And God says, I am faithful. And I am going to bring you home with me. Trust me. Believe in me. And you will come home with me to a place where there is no more stress or anger or frustration or sorrow or sadness. And you say, it's too good to be true. And God says, I promise. Heaven's a promise about what's coming based on who he is. You know, one of the aspects of the promise that I think a lot of people, even Christians, don't get is that one of the promises is that we will have new bodies. Isn't that awesome to think about? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14 says it this way, We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. Just like Jesus was raised up and got a new body, so are we. We're going to have the same body too. We're going to have a new body as well. 2 Corinthians 5 says this, for we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, I'm talking about the body like a tent, you're going to fold it up one day. That is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we're going to have a permanent house in heaven. An eternal body, not this one that aches and sags and bags and ages and gets sick. For we're going to have that one made by God himself and not with human hands. This is a temporary tent we're living in right now. Because friends, ours is a resurrection faith. 
It's about the resurrection. Nowhere does the Bible teach that you're going to be some floaty ghost, you know, flitting around like some being, or you don't become an angel. You don't, none of this stuff. You're not going to get your wings like Clarence. It's not the way, it's not in the Bible. It's not, not it at all. If, if that ethereal sort of weird floaty stuff, how horrible. God made a physical universe. He made a real planet. He made you with a real body. That's part of who you are. And now we live under the effects of sin, so our bodies are wasting away, Scripture says. It, it, and some of you are ahead of others on this, but we're getting old and fat and saggy and baggy and sick, and one day we're just going to fold up this old, te- this old tent and put it away, but God's going to give us new bodies. Can I get an amen for new bodies? Yeah. Go read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The whole thing is about the resurrection of our bodies. Just like it says, just as Jesus came and took up residence in a body, one day he folded that tent up. He went into the tomb, but he came back out and he had a new body and we're going to follow suit. He was the first fruit. We're coming right after him in the same way. God raised him up and gave him that imperishable body. And the promise that God makes, the promise is, he says, I promise I'll do exactly the same thing for you if you just trust me. When you say yes to follow Jesus. You're not just following him in this life. You're saying you're going to follow him right into a grave. But you're also going to follow him out of the grave. And you're going to follow him into having a new body. And one day, you can put your hand up to next to his, his nail-scarred hand and give him a good solid high five. That's the promise. And the promise isn't just about our bodies. This resurrection stuff is like the whole earth is being renewed in God's final kingdom. And we can only imagine what that's like. But all the things that are wrong with this world, God's going to be renewing it. And and we're not going to float up into some sort of cloudy heaven. God's coming here. He's making a new heaven, a new earth right here. This is where we will spend eternity in a new heaven, a new earth. That's why if someone tells me, I think heaven sounds boring. I just know they haven't read the Bible. And they haven't a clue what's going on with this. You're not going to be on some deserted island. Think of the best moments you've had in your life on this island earth. Think of the most intensely joyful and amazing experiences you've ever encountered in this life. Friends, those are hints of heaven. That's what they are. It's like, it's like a little bit of the heaven without all the bad stuff. Just, just imagine it. Like so, so, you know, what, what, what do you love? Your favorite music maybe and how it makes you feel? Or coming in after raking leaves on a cool fall day and dr- eating your favorite soup. Or as kids lying on the warm grass in the summer looking up at shooting stars and talking with a friend that just gets you until the wee hours of the morning. Or riding your bike down a hill with the wind blowing through your face. Or riding in a kayak and seeing a turtle swim right underneath. Or watching an eagle soar and imagining you doing it too. Whatever you love about this earth, man, those are hints of heaven. The things that we love about this life, the best things that this world has to offer are previews of the greater life to come. What do you love? Gardening? I mean, if you're into that, okay. There'll be a garden in heaven. Finishing a puzzle? What turns you on? You know, adventure, painting? Biting into a perfect pair. Heaven's going to have all of that times a million. It's a place of relationships and belly laughs and good meals by the fire and joy and creativity and learning and adventure. If you love a poopy, a, pu- a pu- poopy, no. Will there, that's our next question. Will there be poopy in heaven? No, no, no. If you love a puppy and, and you love sitting by the fire, And just having a good moment with friends. That's, heaven will have that. It's a place of relationships. A place of, I love three-part harmony. It's going to be in heaven. I love a beautiful sunset. I love the beach. I love the mountains. It's going to be in heaven. All the greatest experiences you've ever had in life. When you smell a newborn baby right behind the ears and they smell like fresh potatoes. I love that. 
the most, when you get a brilliant idea and you're so excited to execute it, when you feel fully alive when you travel, whatever it is, the feelings and insights, those are transcendent glimpses of God and they touch a deep place inside of us because they're echoes of Eden and they're a foretaste of what's coming in the next life and God says it's so amazing, I promise, I promise, I promise. It's coming. Heaven is more than a promise. It's a presence. It's not about a place, y'all. It's about a person. It's about a person. It's about the presence. And I know we may get excited about, I can't wait to see Uncle Fred, who, you know, he went, he loved the Lord. He's there. It's like, great. See Uncle Fred, but you're going to be way more excited about seeing the Lord Jesus. It's about the presence of God and all that God represents that finally is there. It's all the good stuff we have in this life without all the bad. Remember that friend of mine who was on his deathbed, not feeling so great, with questions. Jesus' friends were like that, like we all are sometimes. And these are words he spoke, which I believe are words for us. He says in John 14, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in me. There's more than enough room in my Father's home. Isn't that a beautiful way to describe heaven? My Father's home. And there's a place. He says, if this were not so, what I've told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to go get a room with your name on it. And I, got, I, I, I told you that. It's true. When everything's ready, he doesn't say when, but he says, I will come and I will get you that you may always be with me where I am. Presence. The Bible doesn't always answer all of our questions about when or how, but it answers the most important ones like what and who. And what is, you're going home if you're a believer in Christ. And the who, you're going to be with Jesus. There was a guy who went to the doctor, and uh, he was preparing to leave the exam room. And he knew the doctor was a Christian, so he kind of said, Doctor, I, I'm, I'm kind of afraid of dying. And I'm wondering, can you tell me what lies on the other side? And the doctor started to say, well, not exactly, not really. I mean, he was going to tell him some things from the Bible, but before he could answer, the guy said, wait a second, you're a Christian and you don't know what lies on the other side? And just then, the, fam the doctor's family showed up at the office to visit, and they brought the family dog. And that dog was outside the door and sensed the master was inside and started scratching at the door and whining and whimpering and wagging his tail. And then they opened that door, and that dog sprang through there and jumped up on his master and licked him, wagging his tail, just going nuts, so excited and so happy. And, and the doctor thought of him, and he said, you see that? That dog, he'd never been in this room before. He didn't know what was on the other side of this door. But he knew I was here, and that was enough. And friends, no eye has seen or ear has heard, and we can't really imagine what lies on the other side of death's door exactly. Scripture's told us a lot, but the main thing we know is that Jesus, our master, is there. And that's enough. It's enough. And you won't be sad about anything. You'll be with him. That's what Scripture's saying in Revelation 21, verse 3 and 4. It talks about how God's home is now finally here. There's no separation. God's not a far and distant, and I can't get to God. He's right here with us. And he will be with us, and he will be he, we will be with him. And then he says in verse 4 that he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow, crying or pain. All those things are gone forever. Awesome. My friend is the pastor at a church in California where three of those kids who were shot go to his youth group. One of them died. So he spent a lot of time this last week with people who, were, who had plenty of crying and sorrow and tears. A buddy of mine just got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Another said, you know, my mom's got Alzheimer's, we just found out. You ever get tired of it all? You ever just feel like you can just groan with the whole earth under the ache of sin? Uh, all, all the bad stuff in the earth is just sort of like tastes of hell and all the wars and the abuse and the arguments the goodbyes always saying goodbye to somebody I hate that don't you ever just long for something beyond this life and I think God wants us to I think he wants us to place our confidence in him tether our faith 
to the one who says, I promise my presence, and you can look forward to it and let that hope infuse the present. Let yourself imagine the day when Jesus greets you face to face and puts his arm around your shoulder, welcomes you home, and then with his index finger wipes that last tear that you'll ever shed from your eye and says, welcome home. This is for those who trust Christ. Let me pray for you. God, I pray that if there is even one person who has not yet trusted Christ, who doesn't have the confidence of heaven in their spirit awaiting them, not based on how good they are, but based on how much they've trusted you for their salvation, God, that they would make that decision today. We thank you for making a way for each of us to find our way to you through Christ. And we, we ask that that hope would just infuse our lives and help us to be people who bring your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven as best we can now and wait for that day when it's going to be so awesome we can only imagine. We love you. And we even ask, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.